Right, just to introduce the subject on, uh, uh, on surgery as uh, part and parcel of uh, uh, universal health coverage and um, sustainable development goals. It takes me back to the Association of Surgeons of East Africa, uh, which uh, was formed around 1950 um, uh, something, late 50s, uh, uh, or early 50s actually. And it proved to be a leader in not just surgery, but in health and education development here in Eastern Africa. It was the members of the Association of Surgeons of East Africa that were instrumental in uh, advancing medical education here, like starting the, uh, the, the postgraduate program in the MMed program, not just in surgery, but also for the whole was led by the surgeons. And they were very foresighted people and also very committed uh, to uh, 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 social uh, 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 responsibility to the people and to quality. In 1980, they held a symposium in Mombasa titled uh, uh, Surgery in Africa in the year 2000. And this is a follow up to, on their part to the Alma Ata Declaration on Health for All by the year 2000, which had just been uh, promulgated two years earlier. And out of that symposium on surgery in Africa in the year 2000, it was decided by them that it is the rural poor in Africa who are missing out. And we should do something in a rural area to demonstrate that it is possible to access quality surgical services uh, uh, in uh, those rural areas in Africa. And lo and behold, I was then a flourishing cardiothoracic surgeon in Nairobi. I was heading the department there. And they persuaded me to go and implement this idea of uh, cost-effective rural surgical services. So I left Nairobi and went to a mission hospital in Eastern Uganda, Ngora Hospital, to implement this project. They paid my salary from their own personal, uh, uh, personal income. One would pay $50, another $100, and so on, and, and so on. So out of that came the College of Surgeons of East, Central, and Southern Africa, out of our experience uh, 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 at uh, uh, the Ngora Hospital. So the message I would like to share with you here as we start our discussions is that it is we, the leaders in surgery who need to have those attributes of caring for the people, caring for the common good, and therefore mobilizing so that all people in the world can access essential surgical care. Even convincing the world that surgery should be part of the SDGs and UHC it has not been all that easy, but we've done it. And we moved together with the, those in obstetrics and gynecology and all the other uh, uh, surgical related uh, disciplines, including anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, in the surgeons, East African surgeons, we also included radiology. We also included pathology among our members. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I have great admiration for those people. And this, the group who is here now, I would like to uh, uh, commend that spirit and hope that as we talk today, we are going to end up in this World Health Summit, placing surgery where it belongs at the center of universal health coverage. So with those introductory remarks, I would now like to invite uh, Professor Patrick Chamanwa to take us through the presentations and, um, uh, 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 and then we move on from there. So Patrick. Thank you very much. Professor Omaswa, our chair for this session, and good day to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining this very rich session where we are going to highlight the success stories in advancing universal health coverage, and in particular, safe surgery in Africa. 
and also to leverage these experiences to create sustainable surgical systems towards the achievement of the sustainable development goal number three. So we have six speakers and I'm now going to introduce the first speaker who will address the aspect of building adaptive and relevant training methodologies to meet the growing surgical and trauma disease burden in low and middle income countries. And this is Professor Moses Karukande. Professor Moses Karukande is the chair of the Department of Surgery at Makere College of Health Sciences and has been a medical practitioner for over 25 years during which he has developed several practice tracks. He is a medical educator, he's an expert with special interest in quality assurance. He's a general surgeon with interest and experience in minimally invasive surgical techniques. Professor Garokande also holds a PhD in breast oncology. And he's also widely published with over 130 peer reviewed publications. He's currently overseeing several research projects and he serves as the chair of the University Council of Clark International University. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Professor Moses Galkande. And our question to him today is, surgical education has for long been known to be by apprenticeship. And Makere University has been training surgeons for several decades. How has surgical training evolved over the years? And how has Makere adopted to ensure and maintain quality in surgical training? Moses, please. Thank you very much uh, for those, uh, for that kind introduction. And, um, and the question, I will I share some slides here. I hope they can be seen. Yeah, we can see them. Great. So I will uh, skip that. Um, put, put them on slideshow so that they yeah, exactly. OK, yes. it's all yeah, good it's now. Good. You can proceed, please. We're good now? Yes, sir. Uh, sure, many know very briefly, uh, Makere on record started in 1922. And, and in 1970, um, it offered degrees MBCHB under its own name. Um, before it was the University of East Africa. And, and I actually read uh, the book Professor Odonga wrote, and we had our first group of MN students in 1970. And the big mission was to meet the manpower needs um, of the country, actually not only the country, but the region, uh, because we were training for, for the region East Africa then, uh, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. And I think that mission has carried on um, and this slide just shows the number of health workers and how I many of these are doctors and the majority of this number has been contributed to uh, by Makere. I, because the subject is surgery, I looked up uh, to see where we are at in terms of service delivery. And this, and this is a caseload uh, from a couple of studies and doing over 80,000 procedures about 10 years ago. The numbers have changed very much, uh, which gives us 241 case, uh, cases per 100,000 per year. And just for comparison, Australia is over 10,000, Zambia is 722, Rwanda, I think, sits at about 300, and, and the region not very far from what Uganda is at. And the majority of these are obstetrics and gynae. And, and our surgical, our animate surgical need is huge. Uh, in a study I participated in about four years ago, uh, we estimated it at 3.6 million. And 1.38 million needed surgical treatment and 2.3 needed a surgical consult. 
Uh, I just done a survey as well to see uh, as much as Makere has done very, very good work um, training. Uh, and, and I share this table to just show you on the left hand side, a selected subspecialties, how many of these people we have. These are specialists in those areas, um, orthopedics and so on, after general surgery. And that's the number we, we we know we have right now. And uh, the next column is the output, that's the training. And uh, the trainers are mostly Makere, but uh, now we have Mbara University as well, KIU, um, Uganda Matters of Kozi, and of course, Cosexa. And I'm sure Jane will speak to this at some point. And uh, this is again, a, uh, we have another column there on the right, that's the estimated need. And this is a number from the leaders in the field, this is a number they think that if we had, we will be almost fine. And you could see, you could see the gap there. Uh, there is a gap two to eightfold. Um, now, to, to achieve what is in blue and that column, a number of things have happened. And also as we move towards what you see in red, uh, a number of things have happened, and this slide speaks to successful experiences. We've had collaborations in the region and internationally, and, and, and that can be uh, all this speaking about that. We've sustained and grown training programs from, from, from the one I've indicated in the 1970s, where there were a few disciplines, three, uh, now to tens of them. Uh, we've sustained the MA training model, which incorporates research, uh, a critical component for advancing any discipline. And we have a renewed interest in PhD studies. At the moment, we have seven in the department. Uh, and that's catching on in, uh, in, in, in other institutions as well. Our research is on the, we have a new zeal there. We're tapping into the available resources of also, also uh, linking in with the collaborations. Uh, lots of work is into doing a surgical biobank and many other things, minimal invasive surgery, critical care, and some other exciting um, bits like uh, stem cell therapy. Um, getting to your question of how have we adopted, um, what adaptive training methods have we had to to sustain quality and, 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 and move with the times and deal with the challenges that are not few, but many. The first bullet there, I've called it prescriptive hands-on training model. Um, prescriptive as opposed to opportunistic. Opportunistic is where a trainees will come to an institution and they do what they find. Uh, what they find, they don't do but we've evolved to move to being prescriptive. We define the competences, we scrutinize the logs, and if there are any missing things or exposure, we insist that this exposure is, is attained. We are experimenting at the moment on enhanced supervision. You know the challenges of supervision, uh, fewer teachers, more students. So we, we, we've done a pilot of um, recording it, the Google Glasses, where the trainees do operate and the supervisor is, is, is at a remote site and they can see what's going on, but also reporting. We would call that supportive technology. Uh, we've also um, interrogated uh, pre-training experiences for our uh, trainees before they enroll. What has been that exposure? And we've discovered that it's quite rich. Uh, people have amassed over 2000 hours of surgery and we think we should capture that. We think we should, we should start speaking into what that process is going to be like and consider it as part of training. Uh, exchange your supervisors is ongoing uh, and examiners, uh, and, and you can read that as peer review of processes. Um, fellowships out there where we can't uh, do it in our place. Uh, and then we've, we've, we've also started a master's in health professional education. Like we all know, uh, training and teaching is more than just having experience, but it's, it's a recognized area now. And we, we have it in the college. It is open to all professionals in the region. 
and we're having um, good enrollment there. And my, maybe my, my last slide, um, how do we advance uh, safe access to surgical care? Um, I think those are the four points I could say. We need to, to, to do a lot of work on the health workforce, like you all know the numbers. In that slide where I showed what we have and what the gap is, increase those numbers, work on retention, work on incentives, how about the infrastructure, when I spoke to neurosurgeons, they say, well, we can post a neurosurgeon out there, but then they need equipment, they need CT scans, they need, they need, they need space uh, and all that. And uh, definitely funding. Um, so the push through of surgery as an integral part of the minimum package is, is critical. Uh, we are on the way to to drafting the national plan for surgery, obstetrics and anesthesia, and hopefully that will feed into the bullet there for advocacy. We need the right policies, but these policies need uh, evidence uh, and we need data to, to, to feed into that. Uh, we've been accused of not doing a very good job advocating for, for surgery, and I think we can take up the challenge and we're taking up the challenge to advocate best we can. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Garukande, for that very succinct presentation. You've raised several aspects that you've been able to address and still identified many more gaps, which we hope we shall address in the Q&A uh, session. Our next presenter, ladies and gentlemen, is Professor Emiola Oluwabuni Olapade Olaopa. He is going to give us a West African flavor of what Professor Garukande has given us uh, from the Ugandan perspective. Professor Emiola is professor of surgery at the University of Ibadan, which is also his alma mater. He's a man of many trades with interest in surgery, urology, molecular biology, medical education, health systems research and development, etc. He is widely published with over a hundred publications and is the immediate past provost of the College of Medicine at the University of Ibadan. He has been advised on health professionals training to the WHO, to the US, Norway, and several African countries, and is a member of several councils, including the West African College of Surgeons and the Societe Internationale de Urology, and is also a fellow of the Nigerian Academics of Academy of Science, Medicine, and Medical Specialties. He's going to talk to us about a similar aspect of training, and we now welcome him. Professor, please. The question today for you is, the majority of universities in Africa have independent training programs with their surgical trainees attending all of their education in the parent institution. To what extent can inter-university partnerships promote universal standards in surgical education and feasible, and how feasible is a single African Surgical Practicing License. Professor, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, let me say that I'm going to um, say some things that are similar to what the earlier speaker has spoken about. And I'm going to try and answer the question in, uh, uh, in a way that would uh, ensure that uh, we all see what the problem is on ground practically. Um, first of all, I think this is a very good session because it uh, allows us to have a sunrise looking at surgical care. Normally, surgical care is left out in all this uh, World Health Summit as a focus. I bring you greetings from Ibadan, which is a nice, sleepy state town, and the university, which is the first in West Africa and from my College of Medicine and the University College Hospital. 
Um, we have a rather large faculty and um, set of residents, uh, which are drawn from all over Nigeria. And indeed, we have uh, residents coming in from West and Central Africa. Our medical school is the oldest, and this is uh, at the heart of the question that has been asked. Uh, because in West Africa, since uh, we are the oldest, we've helped in uh, capacity building across West Africa. We've initiated postgraduate medical teaching in West Africa, where the home of the West African College of Surgeons and the Association of Medical Schools uh, in Africa. And we've developed the templates that most medical schools in Nigeria in particular, but beyond have used. It's important that we realize when we talk about Africa that uh, it's, Africa is a large continent, it's not a country. And the slide I show shows you can fit in so many of the large countries into Africa conveniently, United States, China, India, and most of Western Europe, and definitely the UK. So when we talk about trying to have a unified um, surgical training curriculum, you can see the difficulty straight away. Uh, not only that, we need to consider the realities of surgical practice in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. Uh, this is a combination of paradoxes of disease characteristics, population characteristics. The patients are all different. The infrastructure is varied. The health systems, when you look at the hospitals, expenditure and policies, and the colonial background are all different. Uh, and the role of the colonial uh, uh, countries uh, continues to be important because uh, they're there as funders, partners, and regulators. So in reality, uh, we, the paradox that we, uh, we are trying to address is, 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 is very much on ground with us. Uh, there are variations in systems, uh, there are differences in the training curriculum. We continue to struggle with the limited number of surgical specialties and those that are available are mal distributed. The teaching facilities we all know are far from what is uh, required. And most importantly, funding is, is there. Uh, the capacity for postgraduate research remains weak. And this means that we do not have a lot of homegrown data on which we can base our decisions. Uh, and now, most importantly, is our increasing difficulty in retaining the doctors we train. When you add to that the challenges that are going on now uh, across the continent with overpopulation, uh, uh, changes in disease patterns, uh, the effects of uh, environmental change, the effect of uh, increasing conflict from terrorism and ethnic wars with internal displacement and migration, or changing not only the disease epidemiology, but causing insecurity and increasing the brain drain, uh, the lack of policies to address this, uh, and the increasing poverty, you can see immediately that each country uh, has a problem in trying to maintain what would be a universal standard. Um, it is therefore not surprising that the various teaching hospitals uh, have their own curricula uh, because they now have to contend with these various changes uh, in epidemiology, in the number of patients and students they have, uh, the increasing cost of surgical care. And Importantly, uh, the increasing prominence of mostly unregulated alternate health uh, providers. All these are the consequences of the various uh, paradoxes I described before, which have led to the differences in training curricula and the perpetuation of the same in trying to provide surgical care. Indeed, I think the question that should be asked is that, is it possible to have a universal training curriculum? And I say no. And I'll show you some evidence of that from what we are doing in Ibadan. Uh, in Ibadan, we have a surgical residency in all specialties, and we also have some post-fellowship programs. Uh, we have training workshops for consultants and our residents and our students, continually looking at what the new requirements are in terms of uh, skills and disease patterns. We continue to focus on research, numerous research projects. We've introduced dissertations into fellowship diplomas to try and ensure that our residents have an understanding of what is going on in the environment, not just from the practice perspective, but also from the scientific side. And this has led us to develop some teaching and surgical care aids, which are peculiar to our own environment, which has helped us with that curricula. And of course, most importantly, uh, we are presenting uh, and we're publishing our, our data. And this has impacted on the curriculum 
across borders, particularly the West African curriculum. The West African curriculum has two major components, uh, the Francophone and the Anglophone. And trying to unify these two curricula, we have found that unless we looked at the individual characteristics of uh, individual, uh, the epidemiology of diseases in individual countries, it will be difficult for us to unify. Eventually it was decided that the best thing to do was to ensure that each of these training um, curricula was focused at the local requirements, but making sure they attain global standards. Uh, so to ensure that this is uh, effective, we looked at our access to surgical care and we have 80 consultants and over 200 residents uh, all offering surgical service, both in our hospital, but then we go into the rural areas. We are able to attend to about 15,000 new cases as emergencies and outpatients about 45,000. But we have four rural medical centers and regular outreach programs to which we bring, uh, draw from in terms of what is going on in the rural area. However, I must say, uh, that Ibadan is blessed by the fact that we have input from other uh, teaching hospitals uh, coming in to discuss with us, and that enables us to unify our curricula as we go along. Uh, AMSA has played some role in this uh, because uh, despite its initial problems, it has eventually come back uh, to realize its, uh, its, uh, its, its uh, importance. And where it has contributed uh, importantly has been its uh, publication in 2016 of the minimal requirements for professional capabilities across Sub-Saharan Africa as a template for each medical school and each postgraduate college to use as a guide to develop their local standards, while uh, their local relevance, whilst ensuring that they maintain global standards. That we believe is the way in which we can go forth because definitely we are seeing different things across the West African sub-region, but the standards that are required are the same. The challenges that we face are the same. Um, I think I will end there and let the questions uh, draw things forward. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Emiola. Certainly these are very important issues that you are raising that call for a well contextualized training. But I'm happy to, to say that it's good you have ended with the need for standardization. Certain standards have to be uh, upheld. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, our next presenter is going to talk to us about the need to integrate essential and emergency surgical care into national and continental health care strategies. And this is none other than Dr. Charles Olaro, who is a senior consultant surgeon and the current director of health services in, in charge of curative services at the Ministry of Health in Uganda. Before this, Dr. Olaro was the Director of Clinical Services at the same ministry and has served in several other strategic leadership positions in the health sector. He is a specialist surgeon, but has also gone on to have a master's training in health services management and in business administration. Welcome, Dr. Olaro. Our question to you today is, among the specific targets of the Sustainable Development Goal number three is the achievement of universal health coverage. This also entails ensuring universal access to safe surgery. As a strategic leader in government, the government of Uganda, what strategies are being put in place to ensure the achievement of universal access to safe surgery by the year 2030. Dr. Olaro, you're welcome. Please yeah. unmute and go to the presentation. Thank you, Chair. The slideshow format. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> As I've been already introduced, those are, those are my names, and I work for the Minister of Uganda. First, I want to first bring to you all of us are aware that surgery is really an integral and indivisible component of healthcare. And clearly it's critical to achieving the universal health coverage and the SDG goal target three. And the unmet need of surgery in Uganda remains high, contributing definitely to premature death and suffering and leading to disability due to preventable and treatable surgical illnesses. And um, yes, answering the question, they, all these are anchored in the National Health Policy 3, which uh, translates the Ugandan government overall vision of development of the health sector as, as is set out in the National Vision 2040 and the Sad National Development Plan. But specifically looking at the at surgery, I, I did look at the five indicators which are which were which were put down by Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, which are looking at the key performance indicators for monitoring surgical outcomes, surgical systems. And I, I, I was able to get data for some data for three of them out of the five indicators. And if you looked at the proportion in terms of access, we found that and its recommendation would having a minimum of 80% coverage of essential services and anesthesia services per, per country. We found that 54% of Ugandans are within one hour walking distance of a health center for or a higher level, which is a general hospital or regional referral hospital. So that's the term, the first indicator. In terms of the specialist surgical workforce density, the recommended is to have 20 surgical and surgical anesthesia and obstetric physicians per 1,000 population. In our case, we have a total, looking at the 2019, it indicated that we have only 696 specialists, which gives a ratio of about 1.57 per every 100,000 population, which is really quite low for you to be able to be able to provide so whereas you have access in terms of timely, in terms of infrastructure, but you are not probably not going to be able to, to get it. In terms of number of surgical procedures done, again, it's estimated that you should be able to have 5,000 procedures for 100,000 populations. When we looked at ours, it means that we have about 100,000 surgeries per 1,056 surgeries per population of 1,000, which mean represents only about 20%. And that's where a fact comes that we have about 80% of people with animate need for surgery in, in the country. We try to do a spatial distribution of surgery performed in the country. And as, as you can see, the, the dark blue, the dark green indicates those where they are able to perform between 4,000 and 8,000. And when we mapped it, you find that most of this where there is high surgery across the country is either around the, distributed around the national hospitals, regional referral hospitals, followed by the general hospitals. And yet you find that at all in the country, you found that are, the hospitals are distributed. So you find that there are some areas where Inequitably, there is low surgery being provided at at less than at 10 to 100 cases per 100,000 population. Again, this just really try to I, I, as we are talking of surgery, I try to extract only facilities which are um, providing surgery, and that's from the health center for upwards. And also, I looked at their distribution across the country, because this definitely has got equity, equity issues. And you can be able to see that there are areas which we, we need to mark. If you reflect back on the national health, health national policy, it states that for every two, two, two million people, there should be a regional referral hospital. Currently, we have 20. And the 20, I must say here, for people to know that 
we have captured, we have uh, equated all facilities in the country, both government and private, not for profit and private, in two different levels. So you will find that the 20, 16 of them are government and four of them are, are private, not for profit. Then we are creating in highway hospitals, which are slightly going to be much more higher level than what? Than the general hospitals and as such. That's what that table intends to mean. At the same aspect, definitely for you to be able to deliver surgery in the context of COVID, as a country, we are also monitoring what's the impact of COVID in, for us to be able to deliver surgery. And this figure is just to represent the number of surgical cases performed virtually in 2020. And you see that the, the numbers dropped in March. And uh, there was also a drop in November and December, probably because of the Skype, the, 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 the increase, the spike in the number of COVID cases. So definitely do COVID does affect already a bad situation and you will be able to see that there's a reduction in the number of surgery cases. That's in terms of cesarean birth and we find that this was less affected despite the trend sometimes even increasing. So it wasn't, it's not affected much. So this, uh, these are the numbers. You can have a look at them. So what are the next steps, Chair, as I, I come to the end? The Ministry of Health definitely has a, a resource strategy and, and training plan, 2030, 2020 to 2030. And in addition to that, we definitely, I'm happy that now we have approved the training of, of fellowship. And we think that this would be one method for us to be able to increase the number of, of, of specialists. We have also developed an agile measure to increase the surgery, obstetric, and uh, anesthesia workforce to address the health force needs. And we are working with the Minister of Education to move some of the scholarships on some of the courses, either certificate or degree to graduate courses so that we can be able to have. The other aspect is that if we fill the vacant post, filling the vacant post would move the, the SOA number to about three per 100 population. We are also expanding the structure and we think that we should be able to have the structure up to the general, I mean the general hospitals. And we have expanded it. I hope it gets approved by the public service. And we think that we definitely need to have a supportive environment. We need a referral system. We need a good blood system because definitely surgery goes with safe blood you, you very, is key important. And we think that as a country, we need to develop a national surgery and an and obstetric policy, which will guide so that this is really will be like a, give a hallmark of what the country does. In conclusion, we need to increase training and retention of specialists. We need to fill the gaps. We need to equip, we need to staff, and definitely we need to provide enabling environment for surgery and anesthesia obstetrics in the country. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles Oraro, uh, for that very good presentation. Uh, as you've noted, there is a 10-year strategic plan, 2020-2030, which is having a systematic approach to the different facets required. So I look forward to further discussions in the Q&A session on this. Uh, one of the things you've raised is the need for collaborations and also the need to address the unmet needs and to talk to us about the impact of existing global surgery initiatives, especially on the African continent, is our next speaker, Dr. Scott Kolo from Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Scott, good morning. I know we've had to wake you up very early in the morning to be part of this, and we appreciate it greatly. Dr. Scott Kolo is faculty at the Program in Global Surgery and Social Change at Harvard Medical School. He previously served as Chief Medical Officer for Interplast, which is now called Research International. He has worked to facilitate surgical development and capacity building 
across the world in South Asia, Central and South Africa, uh, uh, America, Sub Saharan Africa, uh, and in the islands. He has also worked in practice and hospital administration. And as a plastic surgeon and general surgeon by training, his research interests are in the assessment and facilitation of surgical care delivery in low and middle income settings. And he also goes on to do the economic evaluation of healthcare delivery. His major role at the social change uh, program is in facilitating national surgical obstetric and anesthesia plans, the NSOPs, particularly in the SADAC region. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our next speaker. And the question to Dr. Scott now is that the Harvard Medical School Program for Global Surgery and Social Change has been a key leader in promoting the agenda of universal access to safe surgery and has produced and published extensively on global surgery. What role do international partners play in implementing and attaining the goal of universal access to safe surgery? And how do they best work to support existing frameworks? Dr. Scott, please. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate your conceiving of this topic for this meeting and putting together this panel. It's obviously flattering to be part of this panel. Uh, at the risk of being redundant in my very first slide, I do want to reference the DCP3 Essential Surgery volume. Uh, DCP3 had never paid that much attention to surgery until this last series. The Lancet Commission report, which is sort of the fundamental basis for a lot of the work that we do these days. And of course, the World Health uh, Assembly resolution that admits that surgery really does matter. Uh, regardless of what national surgical obstetric and anesthesia plans are called, they really do drive, the concept really does drive these efforts. And we have to admit and agree that surgery is a disruptive concept. Health plans have been very happy ignoring surgical care for a long time. And here we come in trying to upset the system. Uh, and the issue is this is a totally new concept for a broad, widely encompassing entity. The, uh, for a non-surgeon who is used to dealing with individual diseases, it's sort of a difficult concept to think of something that involves general surgery and children's surgery. Let's face it, what half the surgery in the world is probably children. Uh, orthopedic surgery, gynecologic, neurosurgery, plastic surgery, cancer surgery, across all of these things, trauma surgery. Uh, we bring, we're bringing a lot to talk about, and that's sort of uh, a new concept for a lot of health plans. So what's happened over the last few years to move this needle along, and bear with me as I talk here for a couple of minutes just to talk about the PGSSC, the Program in Global Surgery and Social Change. Uh, it started about, what, 10 to 15 years ago, and its object always has been to develop and expand surgical care uh, that's been the main thrust. And of course, the object is to get surgical care into the national health plan. Uh, we view ourselves more as a facilitator than anything else. Uh, we've put together a couple of conferences, to, a couple of conferences in Dubai, and it really sort of galvanized some of the efforts in Africa and in Asia. Uh, we got the credit for putting the conference together. Most of the faculty was from Africa and Asia. Um, the WHO Wipro uh, region has recently put together what they term a regional action framework for surgical care. And I don't have it here on the slide, but the Southern African Development uh, Cooperative has passed a resolution for all of its countries to institute NSOPs. Obviously that's easier done in some countries than others. And before I move on further, let me just point out that this sort of how to do it manual is freely available online. And I say how to do it actually uh, for anyone, especially I, I was very impressed with Dr. Olero, Olero's numbers a while ago with all the work that's been, that uh, he obviously has done looking at um, surgical resources there. Uh, there's a whole lot more to it than it can just be put into a manual, but this is a very nice uh, document. And again, it's free online for anyone. Um, 
But let's get back to what we're really doing here. I think that the one of the main roles that can be played in surgical and care development is in research. It is the research that enables us to know what's really needed and what the effects are of our work, how we can do things better, how we can make things better. But this also includes assistance in developing research techniques, uh, helping to enable the background work to be done in the countries where it is being done. And that is one thing we at the PGSC have tried to do in the last few years is help facilitate uh, research techniques and the ability to do that. Uh, so that high, high, high level research comes out of the countries that, as they develop their insoaps. Moving along, I know we're sort of pressed for time. Uh, I think Zambia um, may have been the first country to seize the initiative of insoaps and is now evaluating its own insoaps and what modifications need to be done uh, as it renews its five-year plan. It was, it, uh, their current plan expires in 2021 and they're working on, and on improving it for the next five years. Uh, Tanzania, Nigeria, and Ethiopia were right there with them. Uh, we could talk more about Pakistan and the Western Pacific region and others, but uh, we'll move on. I will say that it is very important for each ind individual country to be very aware of its own context. And Pakistan's an example there. It was evident very early there that a national plan perhaps was not as uh, doable as, a, as provincial plans. So they put more effort into the provinces. I think that anytime we talk about NSOAPs and start showing maps that we're showing things that are out of date, uh, uh, and this map is also out of date, but the point is that a fair number of countries have seized this initiative and moved forward with it. So how is all this going? And I think that not surprisingly, uh, countries and health systems are finding that it's easier to do the massive amount of information gathering and analysis and planning than it is to uh, get a gargantuan new concept into the national plan. Uh, this involves eliciting buy-in from governments, from ministries of finance, overseas development agencies, and many others in order to uh, implement these plans. Uh, it's also easier to put forward a plan than to make all the moving parts move. Uh, we can talk more about that if we want. Uh, I think one of the biggest stumbling blocks is financing. Uh, no matter where the financing is coming from, uh, we now are trying to show funders that it's the health system that needs, uh, that needs the help. And that's what surgery is. Surgery uh, cuts across the entire health system and for a funder who, or a planner who is used to dealing with individual diseases, that's a totally different concept. We're starting to see some ideas such as the idea of starting points or trying to address a part of the overall NSOAP with the idea that this approach might be more understandable to funders and even to governments. Uh, UNITAR and the Global Surgery Foundation are currently looking as an example at cervical cancer as a small piece of the surgical puzzle. But with the idea that proper, sur proper care, surgical care of, surg of cervical cancer requires the hospital infrastructure, anesthesia, nursing care, et cetera, that is necessary for much more surgical care to take place. With these building blocks in place, it is a very short leap to more complicated laparotomies, open fracture care, uh, et cetera. Um, so what we have to guard against with this approach is reverting back to vertical programs that can monopolize funding and attention to the detrimental of the overall, detrimental, um, detriment of the overall population needs. So uh, I think we've seen revolutionary progress over the last decade uh, in for safe and affordable surgical care. 10 years ago, no one was even talking about surgical care as part of health systems. The entire discussion was very fragmented just as it had been in 1980 when then WHO Director General Dr. Mahler gave his address describing the massive need for surgical care and essentially asking the surgical community to develop a plan. And perhaps more than anything else over the past few years, we've seen a near complete change in thought process. 20 years ago, so many initiatives to try to increase surgical care you know, consist of a foreign entity. 
Uh, it could be an NGO, it could be a government that might be well-meaning or not so well-meaning, uh, but this entity could show up with the money and a directive that a specific program would be implemented. And a local government or a private sector or university faculty might often have been left with the thought that what the foreigners wanted to do wasn't really what was most needed, but they had the money. And so I think that now in 2021, we see much greater agency on the parts of universities, ministries of health, the private sector to call in the shots and direct surgical interventions as they are felt to be most needed. Um, so now I think we have many countries with active plans to modify their own health systems uh, to address surgical needs. The fact is the surgical needs are about one third of the um, issues that need to be addressed. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Scott, for sharing with us. And indeed, like you've said, uh, the partnerships have helped initiate the writing of the ENSOPs in several countries, and this is still ongoing. But more still, you've mentioned the role of advocacy resource uh, 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 mobilization, and also the support to research and research capacity to support policy. Uh, part of the issues that have been raised by all the speakers, including Dr. Scott, have been the need for training. And not only universities are involved, but also civil society organizations and professional organizations and associations like the surgical associations. So our next speaker is going to address the role of civil society organizations and professional associations in advancing the universal access to safe surgery. And to start off on this is none other than Dr. Jen Fualal. Dr. Jen Fualal is a senior consultant surgeon and the head of the breast and endocrine unit at the Mlago National Referral Hospital. She's a founder fellow of the College of Surgeons of East, Central, and Southern Africa. She's a trainer, an examiner, and presently the vice president of the same college. Dr. Falal is also a honorary lecturer at Makere College of Health Sciences and at Kampala International University, and has been external examiner across Africa on several surgical programs. Her work has been widely recognized both locally and internationally, and she continues to have a passion for training the next generation of surgeons. Uh, Dr. Jane Fuller, our question to you today is, several professional organizations and surgical colleges have come out to meet the existing need for surgical care. To a larger extent, the role of these professional associations and colleges in improving surgical practices is not fully understood by regulators and policy makers. How best can these professional organizations improve the practice and quality of surgical care while addressing the animate surgical need? Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jane Fuller. Uh, Dr. Fuller, are you able to speak? Please unmute. We yes, can see yes. your screen uh, already. Can you get? Can you hear me? Yes, you are now loud and clear. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Professor Chamanyo. Thank you, colleagues, for your presentation. It is quite nourishing. I'm going to present on uh, on the work of Cosexa in the in the Exa region in Africa, and um, as Professor Omaso has alluded before. Uh, COSEXA, that is the College of Surgeons of East, Central, and Southern Africa, is, was a brainchild of the, of the Association of Surgeons of East Africa. 
and uh, COSEXA was officially launched in 1999. So it is about 22 years old now. Currently, COSEXA is, uh, is uh, uh, the member countries are 14 in number, and we have partner countries in uh, the six countries that you see over there, Congo, DRC, Cameroon, Niger, and Somaliland, Lesotho and Gabon. These ones are in COSEXA as uh, part of PACS, that is uh, Pan-African Academy of Christian uh, uh, Society. And um, they have uh, accredited hospitals within their country and COSEXA examines their students. Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons also has hospital training hospitals in Tanzania, Kenya, and Ethiopia. And uh, we also have training hospitals in Somaliland. That is the governance of COSEXA, and I don't need to elude on that. We have a governing council, the executive committee, and then we have the different committees under which COSEXA works. The strategic plan for COSEXA one is to, in the five year strategic plan is to achieve excellence in training and research and best practice in examinations and assessments. Two is to, uh, to give quality surgical care. And the third goal is to build organizational excellence and financial sustainability. This slide shows uh, the programs that we run in COSEXA and we have the membership program which takes two years and then we have fellowship programs in the different specialties and also we've started subspecialties in, the, in our training models. The specialties include general surgery, pediatric surgery, orthopedics, plastic, neurosurgery, cardiothoracic urology, and otorhinolaryngology. Because of the needs assessment, COSEXA is trying to see whether we can also involve training subspecialties. And the one which has come on board is the pediatric orthopedic surgery, because we realize that the, um, the pediatrics need a special care as far as their orthopedic conditions are concerned. And we hope that in the future, we shall get a, a curriculums ready for breast surgery, because as we move into these countries, we see that there's a problem in managing, especially the breast condition, endocrine curriculum, and hepatobiliary curriculum as the subspecialties. How do we assess our students? Um, for the MCQs, we have part, for all the fellowship and the membership examinations, we have MCQs which consist of 120 uh, questions, and we have two papers in that. And part two examinations, uh, we have us at MCFs level since 2016. Initially, we had clinicals for both MCS, but it had proved so heavy because the number of enrollment in the, in the training had become so big. So we have shifted to OSC since 2016 and structured short and viva questions at MCS level. Then because of the big numbers and we needed to be consistent in our examination in 2016, the a court of examiners was established. And uh, by 2017, because of still the number of patients needed for these examinations, we, we, we started having patient-less examinations. Um, COSEXA also introduced com computer-based examination system. And uh, this is because of the recent pandemic because uh, our students could not travel, but they had to sit examinations. And this was uh, implemented in September last year. And our exams are prepared by international panel of examiners and 
and the, the heads of those panels of, ex, of specialties. 64% of COSEXA accredited training hospitals are outside the capital city. So we want to be as far from the capital cities as possible and um, we, so that we involve as many of the young doctors in the surgical training as much as possible. Um, COSEXA has 126 accredited hospitals across all the member countries and also the six partner countries. Currently we have over 800 trainees and over 400 accredited trainers. And um, COSEXA hospitals get accredited every five years. So when your hospital is accredited in the next five years, it is also re-accredited so that you are still worthy to train the specialists. This slide shows the number of accredited hospitals and active hospitals. I'll come to the reason why we have one and zero, like you see in Botswana, they have one accredited hospital, but the, the, it is not active at yet, as yet. Burundi is doing so well. They have two accredited hospitals, both are active. Same with Cameroon, DR Congo. But when you look now at Ethiopia, we have 14 accredited hospitals, but only 10 are active. Gabon is doing well. Kenya, seven of their hospitals are not uh, active and, and so forth. Then uh, you, you will find that not all the accredited hospitals may be active at one point because of uh, either the champion has moved on or they don't have students recruited. This shows the number of trainee intakes um, per, per year. We started with very few students. You can see by 2002, we had only seven MCS and six FCS students. Our first examination was in 20, 2003 for those 13 students that we had. And interestingly, if you look at those figures, the females were 000 up to 2004. Then we had two females, then again it went to zero. But after that, we had a number of females training in surgery, which is very good for our, our organization. Um, so these are the specialties that we train in. Uh, for, you can see that general surgery has the biggest number of, of trainees and orthopedic surgery. The rest are in small numbers, cardiothoracic, almost cardiothoracic, otorhinolaryngology, and pediatric orthopedic surgery still have the least numbers uh, because um, it, there are still new programs in the college. This shows the female enrollment as I alluded before, it started with zero, but now we've climbed up. Um, this shows the number of graduates. We hold graduations every year. And um, you can see that graduations began in 2004 because the first examinations were in 2003, but now we hold graduations on the very year of examinations. So we have gone up with the number graduating. And this also shows the number of female graduates going up and uh, showing that we are doing some work. Now, um, my director uh, clinical services alluded to this retention of graduates. While COSEXA um, gives high quality local training we are also proud to say that we retain most of our, of our surgeons within the sub-Saharan region. 93% of our graduates are retained within the EXA region. Not that the training is not sellable to other countries out of Africa, but it, they are good trainees. We have collaborations with the Association of, great, of Surgeons of Great Britain and Ireland 
who receive our fellows and even put them in their hospitals and send them back to us. And they have, they have given us very good comments or in, a, in regards to our training. What is Cosexta's strength? Um, we have so many clinical examination volunteers from all the regions. Uh, our, we have well-written MCQs and Viva cases. We have visiting faculties from across 120 hospital, 126 hospitals to be uh, specific. And then we have for the journal where we have volunteers, we have the editor, we have reviewers, and we also publish our papers. We have educational programs, um, courses that we give to our students, and, and also basic sciences modules. Currently, we are doing some, allowing our students to do some research and present in the scientific um, uh, meetings. Now, this slide, last slide is supposed to answer my question. Discuss the role of civil society organizations and professional associations in advancing universal safe surgery, safe access to, uh, access to safe surgery. It has been alluded before, Cosexta started as a SEA and became College of Surgeons of East, Central, and Southern Africa. Now we are proud to be working in 20 countries in the Sub-Saharan region. That is already a big club for the surgeons in the Sub-Saharan region. But I will also answer this in at international level, we have a lot of collaborating partners. I will start by thanking the Irish aid, because why I talk about the Irish aid, because it is the taxes, taxpayers' money in Ireland that is helping COSEXA to run all these courses. And uh, it, it has funded in the collaboration program, funded our activities to date for the last over 10 years. Two, we have uh, a, uh, American College of Surgeons who sponsor our female graduates. That's why you see the number of female students have, have risen in the past uh, few years to the numbers we have currently. We have Smile Train and World Federation of Neurosurgeons who are there uh, sponsoring young doctors to train in plastic surgery and neurosurgery. Association of Surgeons of Great Britain and Ireland gives us opportunities for our fellows to travel to UK and have hands on there. Um, Kids OR has sponsored equipping, equipping of our operating theaters, especially the pediatric operating surgical rooms. And this has made teaching of pediatric surgery very enjoyable for our students. Online training is still given by the Irish Aid and RCSI, and sponsored skills training by Canadian Network of International Surgeries and Skills Lab, which were built by them. Then at um, country level, associations in different countries are voices of COSEXA in the different countries. So they, are, they do advocate for more recruiting. I'm and allowing you one more yeah. minute to conclude. Yes. Thank you. They recruit, they advocate for training, advocate for accreditation of hospitals. They facilitate the role and support of super, support supervision for all these, for, for, for the doctors in the rural hospitals. And also, they advocate for recognition of COSEXA training in all these countries. Then finally, at individual levels, the willingness to work and train and transfer skills by all senior colleagues cannot be costed. And I would urge that all senior colleagues at all level should be, take pride in training young surgeons. 
this work is mostly voluntary and no amount of money can pay it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Farrar, for that good presentation, highlighting the operations and successes of COSEXA. You have emphasized the need for collaboration in achieving the health related sustainable development goals. And of course, all other goals also need partnerships, as we know. But more so, you've emphasized the quality of training by bringing on board several players, some resourced from all over the world. And more so, also addressing the surgical need by placing your trainees in the communities, closer to the communities, that are usually underserved, that is away from the urban settings. Thank you very much. Certainly, all our speakers have talked about the need for research, the need for collaboration and partnerships. And so our next speaker, who is the last on this panel, before we go into the Q&A, is going to address a similar uh, issue of partnerships, professional associations, and civil society organizations. And this is Dr. Doruk Ozgedis. Dr. Doruk trained in medicine and general surgery at the University of California, San Francisco, and pursued pediatric surgery training at fellowship level at the University of Toronto in Canada. He has been involved in collaborations to strengthen surgery and anesthesia in Uganda for the last 18 years. He is currently an associate professor of surgery at the University of California, San Francisco, and the director of the Center for Health Equity in Surgery and Anesthesia at the same institution. Dr. Daruk, you are welcome. And our question today is, quite multi-pronged, but I know you will address all the issues therein. There is a renewed call for evidence-driven policy development, especially in health. However, surgical research on the African continent has largely lagged behind. And sustainability has also been an issue following international partnerships how best can research capacity be built in Africa? And what role can international partnerships play in enabling this sustainably? Dr. Daruk, you're welcome. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. It's a great honor to, uh, to be on this panel with uh, so many colleagues and friends uh, for so many years. Um, uh, and greetings from California. Um, as you uh, mentioned, I've been fortunate to be a part of collaborations in Uganda since about 2002. Um, and as I look at um, back at this time, um, some of the challenges remain. And I'll point to this paper from back in 2006 in our early years of collaboration, really stressing recruitment, training, and retention from Professor Galakande, Luboga, and Kijambu. Um, and these really pointed to at that time, which were uh, pointed to us as the highest priorities that uh, international partners could bring is really to help with recruitment, retention, uh, and training. Um, and as a result, um, our group um, that was based here uh, put a lot of effort into this area with many other uh, similar-minded colleagues from around the world uh, and started this group called the Global Partners in Anesthesia and Surgery back in 2007. I had the good fortune um, that year of living and working in Uganda. I had the great fortune of having Dr. Fuelal as, as essentially a senior attending, uh, working with her on her, in her unit um, and learning a lot. But uh, really, essentially, what we tried to do through this group was to support talented young doctors who wanted to become surgeons and anesthesiologists and try to take a, a parallel approach in surgery and anesthesia. Um, and one of the things we learned is it's very hard to fund some of this activity through traditional academic approaches and then required getting uh, funding from foundations and philanthropy. And that has continued to be a really important way of supporting all of this work. And you see some of the people highlighted here who um, have uh, initiated that work and sustained um, that effort. 
um, over the years, we've been fortunate to support and be part of the training of many young surgeons and anesthesiologists um, in Uganda. Just a few of them are, are featured here and are really um, true um, stars. Uh, and it's been uh, incredible to, to work with them over the years. I'll highlight just one of the activities of the collaboration, which has been around trauma training. Um, Dr. Namuga and Dr. Peter Mwanguzi um, have led in the last several years um, trauma training, both in uh, Kampala as well as um, through regional expansion and train the trainers type of model um, that was due to be scaled even further last year, but, um, but held down by COVID. This has been a totally locally led course uh, and we've just provided support and facilitation from the outside. Um, I was mentioning recruitment and retention and surgery as the profession um, as being challenges and that's still true, to, true today. If you look at recent surveys of Ugandan medical students and you ask them what um, specialty they would plan to go into. And you could see there's a very big bar here for infectious disease and smaller bars for pretty much everything else. And again, this was something that was led locally. Uh, and again, I think highlights uh, the need to um, attract young talent into surgery and to develop the profession even further. Um, I mentioned working with Dr. Fualal back as a as a fresh general surgeon, I had just completed my boards um, and I spent time with her and colleagues in Malago 2007 to 2008, uh, working in operating rooms with fairly limited resources compared to uh, the ones I had trained in, in the United States. And I think this is also a very important principle is how much um, that the high income world has to learn from settings with more limited resources. We waste a lot here. We're not very mindful of what we use. Uh, and, and that's just a simple example of, uh, of how much uh, lessons from Africa have for the rest of the world, including high-income countries. Um, I've also seen Uganda really as a, as a beacon of um, essentially surgical innovations. Um, if you start with um, the treatment of Burkitt's lymphoma, a lot of the um, initiatives for, around uh, maternal health and maternal mortality, um, the treatment of hydrocephalus in children in Mbale at the Cure Hospital, um, the, Global Clubfoot Initiative, which started in Uganda. I'm just naming a few of the many um, that I know about over the years. And it is just striking to me how much um, innovation ha has happened there um, through partnerships and through um, very resilient local champions. I'm gonna shift a little bit to pediatric surgery. You see Dr. Sekabira here um, pictured my very good friend and colleague uh, for so many years who runs the pediatric surgery unit. And you could see the challenges in pediatric surgery, again, near and dear to me, um, since that's what I do, um, major deficits in the region, um, which um, Dr. Fulal also mentioned, uh, COSEXA, one of the fellowships is in pediatric surgery, and you can see how small the numbers are across the region. Um, COSEXA has 225 million children in the region um, and, uh, and requires a lot more providers. And so um, a network of us have helped to support uh, local training programs um, such as um, the ones in Kampala at Malago Hospital and also in Mbarara in Western Uganda. And these are pictures of some of the recent graduates and current fellows um, who are being supported through that program. And it's been incredible to see um, these young surgeons uh, progress in their careers and start to lead units. Um, and we have, as I said, um, in addition to myself, a number of collaborators across the US who have leveraged um, training opportunities of various sorts at their own institutions to host trainees and to come and teach and to provide support and to engage in collaborative research. And um, that's the type of approach that has been, um, that's worked um, for us. Um, uh, Dr. Fola showed a similar slide with COSEXA. Um, this is just a slide of some of the uh, different collaborators in pediatric surgery and in children's surgery in Uganda. There are so many. And one of the challenges is coordinating all of that partnership. Um, we hosted a meeting back in 2015 that brought some of these partners together, um, really at the direction of Dr. Kisa, one of the surgeons on the unit, and a, another dear friend and collaborator. And that was really essential to make a roadmap that we could all kind of get behind. And it also created a local charity called the Pediatric Surgical Foundation, which was really needed and overdue. Um, Dr. Kikembo, who is um, pictured here, um, one of the surgeons on the pediatric surgery unit started a database back in 2012. Um, despite being very clinically overstretched, um, it was 
really important to collect data. And he initiated this on his own. And together, um, it's been it's helped us to try to establish the need. For example, discovering that about three percent of the need is probably being met for congenital conditions in the country, and that there's a tremendous potential economic benefit to to treating those conditions and a potential great benefit in decreasing neonatal mortality. Um, and uh, Kids OR was mentioned before, but um, it's a great example of an incredibly dedicated charity to serving children and strengthening surgical capacity in the region. You see um, David Cunningham and Gareth Wood um, met, um, highlighted here, but the first operating room was uh, in Uganda and it was shown to be very cost-effective and expanding to 120 other African centers over the next decade. And I, uh, some of you may be aware that towards the end of last year, the Ugandan team separated a, a, a conjoint twins independently in the kids OR. Um, and I think it just um, was an incredible milestone. Um, this could be done uh, locally um, without any um, international help. Um, and I'll finish by just talking a little about the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery. This is a group that um, I'm part of um, that came together to bring together global surgery and child health. These are areas that hadn't really been brought together um, and really to have it be led by colleagues from LMICs. This is a picture from our last meeting a year and a half ago. I don't think many of us have been at meetings like this since then, that was in January of 2020. Um, and one of the things that this group has done is put together um, guidelines for children's surgical care across the health system from the community up to the higher level. Um, and um, basically put together recommendations from many different specialties. Um, this is kind of what one of the tables looks like, just outlining who should be there, what skills should be present, um, what the infrastructure should be. And many of our LMIC colleagues have used this as a, as a, as a roadmap and then also a way to use uh, to, to make um, needs assessments locally. And I think we have to remember too, when we create documents like this or NSOPs or anything else really that we have to, um, we can't forget the patient um, and see how they journey through the healthcare system. I've just picked one patient here who we took care of together in Kampala with the team who had a Wilms tumor um, that was resected, but how they got from the north all the way down to the Uganda Cancer Institute and got care. We have to keep that journey in mind as we develop systems and protocols. So um, again, I think we just have to think of surgical care as a population health intervention I've mentioned anesthesia and perioperative care. Um, we've sometimes operated um, in silos as surgeons, um, and um, we have to think of the whole ecosystem. And uh, I think for sustainability, the key is that locally driven priorities have to be adopted and, um, and a team approach is needed really between partners um, for success. So I'll stop there. And thank you again for the honor of joining this panel. Thank you very much, Dr. Daruk, for your great presentation. I, again, I thank you for having sacrificed some hours of your sleep to be up to make this presentation. Thank you very much. You have certainly highlighted the need for partnership in developing especially local uh, capacity in terms of local faculty and local specialists that can continue the work even after the partnerships have uh, gone back. And of course, you've also looked at the need to document what we do as part of showing the impact and the evidence, which can lead to more uh, partnerships and access to funding because we, we work in an era of numbers and data and these have to be well captured and also well communicated. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, these are the six uh, panelists we had today. We have 20 minutes for a Q&A. There have already been a few questions online, one of which is pending, the others have been answered. So uh, uh, while uh, we uh, get uh, the hands, I would like to get back to the chair and then he gives further guidance. Thank you. Professor Maswa, please. Yeah, about the time. Uh, uh, Alex Kayongo, you are here. Uh, we have many speakers. We only have five more minutes left, actually, or four. Can we? No, we go, have two hours. When, do we, when can we, how much more time can we get? Alex, are you there? I'm up to four. 
because they can cut us off abruptly. It's not there. We have uh, Chair, we had up to two hours, up to but the two? Six, yes, up oh, to sixteen hundred hours. Oh, sorry, I thought yes. it was ninety minutes, like all the others. So go on, go on, Patrick. Go so on. we could probably ask Professor Galokande to answer the first question, which is directed the, to him. The, and the, this is also Adeline. Adeline. Uh, you see how yes i will invite adeline after this thank you oh, okay yeah. all right go on go on sorry uh thank you chair and members for your patience uh professor Galokande, a member has asked what steps has makerere university made to include robotics artificial intelligence and simulations in the training of surgeons at makerere and after that, we shall have uh, Dr. Adeline to give us a flavor from the obstetrics and anesthesia aspects of surgery. Thank you. Yes, Professor Garokande, you can proceed, please. Sorry, I, I could have missed uh, something. I went off for a bit. No worries. The question is, what steps has Makerere University made to include robotics, artificial intelligence, and simulations in the training of surgeons? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Robotics, not yet. Uh, a number of us have had the opportunity to, to participate. Uh, actually, I was at Yale at the invitation of Duruk and had an opportunity to, to look, to touch, to feel, to see. Uh, it's pretty pricey. And maybe honestly, at the moment, it may not be on our radar for something that would incorporate. Artificial intelligence, of course, artificial intelligence, of course, uh, there, there, there are many things we can, we can do for artificial intelligence to enhance the way we do diagnosis, the way we analyze things. But the best of it is, is we need to, to have a robust system that captures data because artificial intelligence is going to depend on, on what you feed it on. Um, we, we need to interrogate that further to see how we, we, we can benefit from it. To me, it is like the mobile phone. The mobile phone is, is needed even for people who have minimal resources. Maybe most so for people who have minimal resources are limited infrastructure. Simulations, mm. yes, we, we, we've made advances there and we're still uh, going on. Uh, we have skills labs, we have dummies, we have mannequins, we have apps that we're getting on board uh, and we need more champions, more funding to, to, to do that as some more. Um, there was also another question about trauma being left out on things. Uh, and maybe it's the same answer. We need more champions uh, for trauma. Um, the burden for trauma speaks for itself. Uh, the training and visibility is, is kind of buried into the other disciplines. Um, but uh, Olive knows that we've started work on, on seeing how to strengthen and tease out maybe trauma from, from all the things it's, it's buried in. I mean, up to now, we don't have any place that recognizes itself as a trauma care center or uh, and the different levels like, you know. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Garukande. Now, as you know, surgery is not complete without discussing anesthesia and obstetrics. And to give us this perspective is Dr. Adeline Boaten. Dr. Adeline Boaten is an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Harvard Medical School and associate faculty at the Center for Global Health at the Mass General Hospital, as well as faculty at the Harvard Medical School Program for Global Surgery and Social Change, as we've seen from Dr. Scott. She 
she found it necessary to volunteer to us to give us this flavor from the anesthesia and obstetrics aspect, mm -hmm. which appeared to have been underserved. Again, we thank her for waking up early and I invite her now to give us this presentation in just three minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope everybody can Dr. Adeline, okay. kindly unmute. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and, and for giving me a few minutes to um, give some comments. And actually, I, so I have three comments. The last two are really comment questions, which I hope will stimulate some additional discussion from all the distinguished panelists on here. I've, I've learned a lot from hearing from all the panelists. Um, so the first comment that I have is really to, to just highlight the importance of considering um, when we talk about surgery to consider all aspects of this. And I think some of the other speakers highlighted the need to think about obstetrics. I think our very first speaker in, in, um, actually showed that when we think about um, surgical procedures that are performed, the majority of them are actually women's health. I think it was 70% that was mentioned on that slide. And that is something that is replicated worldwide, whether we're talking both about uh, low middle income countries or high income countries. The cesarean delivery, for example, is the most common procedure performed um, in women and actually one of the most common procedures performed overall. Hysterectomies um, as a gynecological procedure are, are the most common um, uh, non-obstetric procedure performed in women. So I think as we think about developing surgical systems, it's really important to consider um, these aspects of women's health, um, which oftentimes can go um, unrecognized or um, undeprioritized, particularly when it comes to surgery. Um, I think actually, uh, Dr. Corlew mentioned the importance about how we've changed our frame of thinking and how that really matters and what um, we drive forward and the funding. Um, and I think um, global surgery as a concept is very different from other infectious diseases where um, the goal has been eradication or removing this. And perhaps pregnancy is a, a key example of how it's essentially different because for our species to, cons uh, to, to persist, we're never going to eradicate pregnancy. It's something that is always going to be a part of our lives. And many surgical conditions are always going to be part of the need for a health system. And this is different from conditions like smallpox, which you could eradicate and no longer need the services for, or maybe what we're trying to do with HIV and AIDS, and certainly what we're trying to do with the COVID-19 pandemic. This is certainly not the case for surgical systems. And so I think that really makes um, an important difference in how we think about creating these health systems, because it's something that is going to be integral and needs to be sustainable and have longevity for our entire species. And then you think about obstetrics, I think that really highlights that. And it's if we use that as sort of a crystallis about, uh, about which to think about surgical systems, I think it can really help inform that um, decision-making. Um, I'll just use my last couple of minutes to make a couple other comments um, and which are also questions yeah, for the one minute, panelists. yes, that it is. Yes, so my question is um, just related to this idea of how to increase um, access to specialty and subspecialty training. I, I think we, we heard a lot from some of the giant institutions in Sub-Saharan Africa, like Makerere and the University of Ibadan, um, where we ha already have a lot of knowledge um, on the continent. And I'm just wondering, I think organically, they have grown to be some um, hubs for regional training. And I'm wondering if some of our professional organizations like the West African College and the SEXA could help um, leverage these to be more deliberate into regional subspecialty hubs, which could perhaps um, enhance our ability for um, subspecialty training. And then my last question is about um, innovation and how we can drive that forward. Um, a lot of the speakers pointed to the gaps that persist. And I think in order to move forward, we have to think about how to work smarter and not necessarily harder. So I'm wondering, how we can incorporate public-private partnerships um, in and drive innovation into improving our surgical systems. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Adeline, for that uh, highlight. You raised uh, several questions. Uh, I will take your first question 
and add it to yet another and direct these to Dr. Fualal. Uh, Dr. Fualal, uh, the last question was about how we can get regional training hubs, leveraging the training. And the second question is, what is the future of the Master of Medicine in surgery training, especially in the region, considering the exponential growth of COSEXA programs and their global recognition? Dr. Farrell, please. Hello, thank you. Um, that, that, those are interesting questions. How yeah, can you we have get one a, minute to answer them. Before yes, we regional, the regional hubs. Yes, we are trying to get centers of excellence for training and also for examination. And uh, as far as training is concerned, we shall still continue with the training in country and then get specialists and examiners from far and wide to come and examine our students from all walks of life. But there is a plan in getting centers of excellence for this training. As for the future of MMED, we are not competing because even with universities, there's so many universities coming up, but we should be, we are trying just to be complementary with the university training and MMED. Of course, you find that some MMEDs actually join the fellowship uh, training after their MMEDs and take on subspecialty training, which is good for them because they are enriching their knowledge and skill. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farah. Uh, before I invite our chair to give the closing remarks, we have two hands. I, and the first one I'm going to take is Martha Namuga. Please make your question very brief and precise. Unmute yourself and ask. Okay, I think we are not able to get the people to ask uh, their questions already. But I will move on quickly to a question directed to Professor Emiola. Professor Emiola, you mentioned the difficulties of standardization of surgical training and highlighted many differences between countries and regions, which are well acknowledged. Yet surgical disease is more similar across the continent than it is different. The question is, can you clarify on what we stand to lose by standardization? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I must correct the impression that I said we'll lose anything by standardization. I emphasize the need for global standards of training and curricula, but local relevance. Uh, and that is a key point because uh, what is available in each country in terms of uh, equipment and technical expertise varies from region to region, even within the country. And the disease prevalence also varies. So the surgical standards are global. There is no difficulty in having a surgical template that is universal. It is the applicability in the different regions that will require that the curricula are adjusted to be locally relevant. Uh, and it, to that extent, I'd also like to briefly comment that in terms of regional hubs for subspecialty training, uh, we have the uh, Pewter Training Center for Urology, uh, which is accredited by the Society International of Urology uh, for scholars from all over Africa. And we've already trained in the last uh, two to three years, well over 30 uh, subspecialty fellows who've come from across Nigeria mainly and one or two from outside of Nigeria. So again, that goes to the fact that you can standardize uh, the major training, but the application on ground has to be of local relevance. That is what makes us surgeons. Uh, uh, an appendicectomy is an appendicectomy anywhere in the world. When you do it, how you do it, on whom you do it is of local relevance. Thank you.
uh, Patrick uh, seems to have dropped off uh, our, our chair, but uh, I, I think also he was just about to call me to make a concluding remarks. The, uh, 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 the first point is really to thank you mm -hmm. all for sparing your precious time to prepare the statements that uh, you have shared with us. Uh, and also to thank all these uh, 50 plus people who are on the, uh, the, the, the attendees, they call them attendees uh, participants list here for caring about this topic and contributing through the chat uh, system. Uh, let me also thank uh, Ronald Mbinde, Mbine. he's uh, here uh, 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 in the panelist uh, uh, panel. He is the one who has worked very hard to put all of us together. So with those thanks, so what next? I think the first take home message for me is that we have come a long way. We've come a long way in that uh, we have a WHO resolution. We've come a long way in that we have this community of promoters of global surgery from both the North and the South. And in order for us to move to the next stage, and the next stage is the one where surgery I, when I say surgery now, I mean all those uh, uh, other partners of obstetrics, uh, anesthesia, including pathology, radiology, all those uh, specialties without whom we cannot move forward. We need leadership, number one. Leadership from people like us. Jane Fualal talked about voluntarism, that you are doing work for which you are not being paid being a, a, a president of COSEXA, being a secretary of uh, WAHO, uh, what is that, West African College of Surgeons, whatever, whatever. And, you know, our partners from, from, from Harvard, from uh, San Francisco, and so on, we need to promote this spirit. Our leadership, voluntarism, mobilizing people to feel good when they are with us. That is how ASEA did what it did. The people who were in it were friends. They hosted each other in other, each other's homes. And they, they, were, they were a common good group. Uh, I, I know a department here in Makerere where the leaders were fighting all the time, unlike surgery. So we need that spirit from us. Let's recruit more people, younger people, older people, uh, so that the culture of uh, being, uh, 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 having the common good uh, the spirit is strong among us. Without that, we are not going to move forward. We also need to remain relevant. I haven't heard a single word today from us on uh, preventive surgery. I'm really talking about how do you promote the cause for which surgery is needed. Here in Uganda, for example, uh, uh, Dr. Kobusinje is in the meeting. She's running the injury center and so on. But now the biggest challenge for health facilities in Uganda, apart from COVID, is a trauma from motor, border borders, these motorcycles and so on. But what are we doing? to raise public awareness on this, to be seen as the leaders who are promoting safe road traffic in the country. It's just as an example, we should be doing that, or those type of things. If there are children who need surgery, are missing surgery, what are we doing to bring attention of the communities to this so that they can see us as relevant and can work with us and give us those resources that we need. Data, data is extremely important. All those things we will not be able to, to say we are relevant uh, uh, without uh, data. And that data is what we should use together with the people whom we serve 
to claim the attention of political leaders. Of course, at the end of the day, it is about resources. And the people who allocate resources in the parliaments of our country are, are the politicians. So we need to make surgery in the eyes of the people, a political issue over which elections are won and lost. And once we get there, we will be where we want to be. I am also not sure where we are. Like, do we have a, a, a position at a WHO headquarters in the regional office of WHO in, in, in Afro, for example? CDC, African CDC now getting a, 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 a prominence in Africa. Where are we there? Many years ago, there was an office in Geneva actually occupied by surgeons, uh, but the position was sponsored by a donor. So we need to, to, to look at that. Who is promoting that, the implementation of that resolution? So with all those strategies, I would like to hope that the global surgery agenda, surgery being uh, accepted and uh, recognized as an essential component of universal health coverage with an indicator. Do we have a UHC indicator? I don't think we do. They are revising UHC indicators. It was interrupted by COVID somewhat. Those of us who can do so, let's look at this. If there is no surgery indicator in, 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 in UHC, let's advocate for it. It's not too late. We still have another uh, is it 20 years or so? So uh, uh, I am sort of uh, one of you, but I'm almost like an outsider now uh, where, where, where I am. Uh, I have stopped operating and so on, but uh, I am a surgeon uh, from the beginning to the end. And I would like uh, to continue journeying uh, with you until the very end. But please, 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 uh, let's consider those remarks which I have made at the end. And once again, I really do want to thank you for taking the trouble uh, to contribute the way you have done. And regular meetings. We go to West Africa one time, wherever, wherever, regular meetings. So please, uh, uh, um, Jane, Patrick, Bunmi, Charles Solaro, Dan Collier, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, our colleague uh, 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 from uh, uh, San Francisco, uh, let's get on, on this. And Ronald Mbine, you are the future. Make sure that uh, you drive us and uh, we achieve uh, all these aspirations on behalf of the people of the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, I think this is now the end of our meeting. And the World Health Summit is so much richer for all of you. And let's hope that the outcome of this particular session is going to be picked up uh, 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 by the, in the documentation of the outcome of this summit. We also need to make sure, uh, Ronald, that that is not forgotten. We, we don't drop out here. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Chair. Bye bye. And all the panelists. And again, my apologies for having had a technical glitch. I wish us a nice stay at the rest of the sessions. Thank you very much.